there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. The events in this program are inspired by a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Bizarre Murders. When a young woman suddenly falls into a coma, doctors at first are mystified. But when they find a rare and life-threatening toxin in her system, they get suspicious. And when detectives discover evidence of an enemy close to home, they realize they're not looking for some common criminal, but someone far more terrifying. Three days ago, Jennifer admitted herself to the hospital. I've just been having a, a lot of trouble breathing. Within a day, she'd fallen into a coma. Jennifer's nervous system is shutting down, and the doctors don't know why. It'll be OK, baby. Jennifer's live-in boyfriend, Tyler, never leaves her side. As Jennifer's body shuts down, doctors make an unexpected discovery. She's ingested a toxin that occurs naturally in a highly poisonous plant called hemlock. You might have heard of hemlock. It's a pretty plant, but you don't want it in a bouquet. It's seriously toxic. The Greek philosopher Socrates famously committed suicide by drinking a potion made from the stuff. And boy, is it an awful way to go. Paralysis sets in, and you can feel yourself suffocating, but you can't do anything about it. It's brutal. And it gets worse. There's no antidote to hemlock poisoning. Even a small dose, less than a tenth of a gram, can be fatal. Jennifer's ingested twice that. It's only a matter of time before Jennifer stops being able to breathe altogether. Considering the huge dose of hemlock in Jennifer's system, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out that she's consumed something that was deliberately laced with the hemlock toxin. As a cop, that ain't something you see every day. Lead Detective Findlay learns that Jennifer was at home the day before she went to the hospital. Since the effects of hemlock toxin usually take 24 hours to kick in, she most likely ate or drank something laced with the poison at her apartment. There's an old movie called DOA that begins with a man reporting a murder. The cops ask him who got killed. I did, he says. He just found out someone had fatally poisoned him. And that's what we have here. But in this case, Jennifer can't give us any clues as to who might have done this to her or why. She's what we call a silent witness. Lab results reveal that a bottle of milk found in the fridge contains the residue of hemlock powder. For Detective Findlay, this is now a case of attempted murder. Getting the hemlock into a sealed bottle without making it look tampered with is harder than it looks. It's like not leaving tracks in the mud. It's pretty tricky. But whoever did this knew what they were doing. Six days after admitting herself to hospital, 
Jennifer dies. It's no longer attempted murder. It's now a homicide investigation. Whoever poisoned that milk must have known someone was in for a slow and painful death. But who done it and why done it are anyone's guess. A deadly prank at the bottling plant? Nah, it's not likely. Quality control would have caught that. A demented milkman? Maybe. But the first person we always talk to is the last person to have seen the victim. Tell me about you and Jenny. Were you having any issues? No, things were great. Really great, man. OK, maybe we were arguing some about money. Jenny was paying the rent. But it didn't matter. We loved each other. Hey, babe. What are you doing? Babe, oh my God. babe, will you make me the happiest man alive? Yes, 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 yes! <laughs> so according to Tyler, things were pretty hunky-dory between him and Jennifer. But think about it. Jennifer was poisoned when she drank milk from her own fridge. And milk has a shelf life, so the poisoning had to be timed properly. Tyler lived with her. He knew when the milk got delivered. In the murder game, that's what we call opportunity. And Tyler himself didn't get sick, which suggests he knew not to touch that milk. Look familiar? The hemlock the doctors told you about? It was found in the milk in your fridge. Jeez, well, how did it get in there? Surprising your suspect, maybe with a photograph or some information. It's an old trick, and it's a good one. As every poker player knows, we all have a tell. It's not proof of anything, but it can scare the hell out of a guilty suspect. And that's a good thing. Things aren't looking good for Tyler. But if he did poison Jennifer, Detective Findlay needs some hard evidence to connect him to the crime. Without that, she's forced to let him go, for now. Jennifer's apartment is now a crime scene. While looking for evidence that could tie Tyler directly to the poisoning, investigators find something unusual. Looks like someone's been sending death threats to these two harmless kids from the sticks, telling them it's either time to move out or get rubbed out. And now Jenny's dead. It's hard to know if it's all some practical joke gone seriously wrong, or if it's something downright evil. Could these letters hold the key to tracking down a killer? Recognize any of these? Yeah, those things. We got one every month for a year. Why didn't you mention the letters before now? I don't know, we just figured it was some sort of prank, like some big city thing. We collected them for fun, but we didn't get one this month, so we threw them in the trash. And I guess I forgot about them. Did Jennifer have any enemies? Old boyfriends that stalked her? No, I'm the only guy she's ever dated. The forensics lab finds something significant, trace amounts of hemlock and microscopic amounts of other toxins, all derived from plants, deadly nightshade, snake root, wolfsbane. The letters cast doubt on Tyler as a suspect. Sure, he had the opportunity, but whoever poisoned the milk and wrote those letters is someone with an education in botany. And Tyler isn't exactly the academic type. Then there's lack of motive. He just popped a question. And investigators also learned that they have no life insurance. After jealousy, that's the most common motive for murder among couples. As a suspect, Tyler's starting to take a back seat. The letters are addressed to Jennifer and Tyler. So whoever wrote them knew who they were. 
and they'd been hand-delivered, not mailed. That means it was someone who had access to the apartment building. Detective Findlay thinks the letter writer could be another tenant. Any issues with the neighbors? Noise complaints, that kind of thing? No, never. We said hi to people in the building, but mostly just kept to ourselves. It's an oldie but a goodie, perps returning to the scene of the crime. But what if they never left? If Jennifer's killer is a neighbor, chances are that person is right under Finley's nose. In other words, it's time to start knocking on doors. There are over a hundred tenants in the building. Yes, I'm Detective Finley. I'm investigating an issue with contaminated milk in the building. To avoid causing a panic, Findlay says she's investigating contaminated milk deliveries, not murder. And she casually drops the word hemlock while she questions the tenants. Have you ever heard of the plant hemlock? Yeah, it's legal in California, I think, right? Detectives have canvassed the entire building, but so far haven't come up with any new leads. No one else has fallen sick, and most people in the building have never even heard of a poison plant called hemlock. But when Detective Findlay reviews her notes, she remembers something a tenant said to her that didn't seem significant at the time. Hello. Hello? I'm investigating an issue with contaminated milk in the building. OK. Uh, have you ever heard of the plant hemlock? Uh, no, I have not heard of hemlock, but contaminated milk, that's no joke, detective. Is there anything else I can do for you? No. Thank you. You're most welcome. The phrase, no joke, rings a bell with Detective Findlay. As it happens, the tenant's apartment is next door to Tyler and Jennifer's. His name is Charles, and he's lived in the building for 15 years. Sure, it could be a coincidence that the guy right next door used the same words as the death threat. But if it isn't some fluke, talk about fearing thy neighbor. Detective Findlay runs a background check on Charles. It turns out, Charles has a criminal record. Looks like back in college days, Charles liked to earn while he learned. He got tossed out for growing marijuana plants in his dorm room and did a stint in the big house for it. His major? An advanced degree in botany. So chances are pretty doggone good that he knows what hemlock is. This Charles fella is looking like a mighty good suspect, if you ask me. After prison, Charles reinvented himself as a rare book dealer, who also invented a role-playing game called Solution. Yes, yes, yes. Where players have to solve murder mystery scenarios that Charles writes. Scenario 21, the Beethoven Solution. Bum, 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 bum. A botany background, a criminal record, the no-joke phrase, not to mention that he lives right next door. It's all pretty fishy. The thing is, investigators don't have any evidence at all tying him to Jennifer's murder. If he is their guy, what they need is for Charles to incriminate himself. And that means staking him out. Detective Findlay's plan is simple posing as someone who's inherited a rare book collection. She'll befriend Charles and hopefully get him to trust her. If this Charles character is the killer, Findlay hopes he'll let something slip and she can nail him for Jennifer's murder. But right now, he's just a long shot suspect. Is the detective on a wild goose chase? Or is she stepping into the lion's den? Hi, I'm Phoebe. I 
emailed you about this book? Yes. It's a pleasure to meet you, Phoebe. Do you know what you have here? This is a treasure. My father had an awful lot of books. Well, I'm impressed. It would be a great pleasure to see the rest of your collection. Now that Detective Findlay's made initial contact with Charles, she can play out her undercover role and hopefully observe him up close. Cheers. Getting your foot in the door is certainly the toughest part of going undercover. If they don't trust you in the beginning, they never will. And if you do get in, believe me, you're usually not hanging out with a brain trust right away. But Charles is a different kind of target. He's smart, he's cultured. It's hard to put the whammy on a guy like Charles, and that could make things tricky for Detective Findlay. <clears throat> What's that? Well, I present to you solution. It doesn't take long for Detective Findlay to insert herself into Charles's life. <laughs> a natural 20 on your first time. She even starts playing Charles's game Solution with him, all the while keeping her ears and eyes alert for anything suspicious. You know, it's so hard to find good company, Phoebe. I can't relate to Riff Raff, and I don't want to. I'm, I'm not afraid to admit it. I, I feel like I am, well, some people are just beneath us. Mm. I mean, wouldn't you agree that the world would just be better off without some people, without most people, really? Yes. Not you and I, come on. <laughs> Charles ain't exactly a team player, is he? Turns out his brains have, well, gone to his head over the years. He's a total snob and proud of it, too. But having a superiority complex does not make you a murderer. And Finley has no idea if he even had Jennifer and Tyler on his radar. After all, people like them are, in his own words, just riffraff. People are just such ignorant apes. But to Findlay, there's something hinky about Chuck. She can't put her finger on it, but that old detective's sixth sense starts working overtime. Weeks go by, but not once does Charles mention anything about Jennifer. Detective Findlay starts to wonder if she's been investigating the wrong person all this time and the brass is giving her the gears. If Findlay doesn't come up with something concrete tying Charles to Jennifer's murder, her undercover operation will be shut down. You are obviously a very intelligent woman, Phoebe, but, well, let's see if you're smart enough to figure out this one. Let's. I call this the Socrates Connection, inspired by a true story from ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. A man is found dead with a hemlock potion beside the body. Oh. Is it suicide or murder? Charles, how clever. If Charles's past as a failed botanist made Findlay suspicious, this clinches it. Charles knows what hemlock is and what it can do. It can't be a coincidence. Detective Findlay now has to wonder if her cover is blown. This is what you call a catch-22. If Chuck is on to Detective Findlay, there's no way he'll incriminate himself now. But if she drops the undercover act, she won't have any evidence to connect him to Jennifer. And that Socrates reference could be one of those hints I like to call a not-so-veiled threat. Keep your powder dry, detective. Charles has lied about knowing what hemlock is, but Detective Findlay has no motive and no evidence that either links him to Jennifer's murder or rules him out. Is it suicide or murder? With the plug about to be pulled on her undercover operation, Detective Findlay decides to try a different tactic. Hi, Tyler. Tomorrow night, 9 p.m. And remember, make it loud. This is remarkable. Your father must have really cared about his collection.
Are your neighbors always so loud? I haven't heard them before. Those bumpkins? Not lately, no. I went next door and asked them to turn it down, told them they were being rude, and well, they, uh, they desisted. But I suppose they couldn't live without their crude rock music for long. Getting Tyler to blast that music was some nice sleight of hand, Detective. Looks like Charles just slipped up. Remember, Tyler told investigators that no one had ever complained about their music, but Charles said he had complained. I guess he needed to explain why Findlay had never heard loud music before. Now she knows that Charles was aware of Jennifer and Tyler, even if they weren't aware of him. They're such ignoramuses. And he obviously doesn't like them. Not one bit. Are you going someplace, Charles? Oh. Yes, I'm off to Italy. There's a book fair there. And besides, I... I need to get away from that. From them. If they would just leave me be and disappear so I could live my life in peace. That's all I ask. <sighs> but I digress. Would you be so kind as to water my plants while I'm away? Of course. Uh, anything. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's the perfect opportunity. When Charles is out of town, Detective Findlay can sweep his apartment for possible evidence. No pun intended, but that's one spine-chilling book collection. It may not be proof positive that Charles is a killer, but it doesn't have to be. For Detective Finley, it's just one coincidence too many. When Detective Findlay searches Charles's storage locker, she finds dozens of toxic botanicals, including a huge stash of hemlock plants. Charles lied about not knowing what hemlock is. He lied about complaining to Tyler and Jennifer about the noise. His remark about contaminated milk being no joke, the Socrates game scenario that involved Hemlock, his obvious contempt for Tyler and Jennifer, and now some bedtime reading that's guaranteed to put you to sleep permanently. Investigators now have hard evidence that connects Charles to the poison that killed Jennifer. But what they don't have is means and motive. Charles's journals reveal that Jennifer and Tyler had unknowingly annoyed and offended him ever since they'd moved in. Imbecile. I can't live like this. He spied on his new neighbors, listening to them through the wall. At first, he complains to himself about their music, their working class jobs, their hayseed accents. As Charles grows more enraged and obsessed with Jennifer and Tyler, a plan forms in his mind. Charles thinks Jennifer and Tyler are way beneath him. The problem is, they're right next door. In Charlie's unhinged mind, the neighbors have to go one way or another. Now, normally you'd just bang on the wall and tell him to shut up, but Charles ain't the confrontational type, and shut up probably isn't in his vocabulary. He has his own way of doing things. The journals reveal just how Charles got the hemlock into the milk. He even boasts of the plan's simplicity. Who would suspect an innocent bottle of milk could be fatal?
the dates in the journals also explain why Tyler didn't get sick. The day Charles poisoned the milk, Tyler was playing a gig. What are you, what are you doing here? Remember me? Charles is charged with premeditated murder. His lawyer tries to paint his client as a quiet, cultured man with an eccentric interest in dangerous botanicals. Quiet. Imbeciles. Charles gets life without parole. Some people are smarter than others, that's a fact. And some people think they're smarter than others. Then there are people who think they're smarter than the police. And that is a big mistake, but it's a common mistake. What's not so common is murdering somebody with a rare toxin like hemlock and thinking you'll get away with it. Here's some advice for the Charlies of the world. If you're going to spike someone, don't use something that only you would know about, because that kind of narrows things down. Better yet, don't poison anyone at all. And if your neighbors are getting on your nerves, call the super. 